Turn in your Bibles to Romans 12, 1 to 12. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, his pleasing and perfect will. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourselves with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, through many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophecy, Prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is in serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is in giving, then give generosity. Generosity, if it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor, serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. The word of the Lord. Hunter, God bless you. Thank you, Rose. Uh, if you would just indulge me for a moment, as I was heading up for prayer time, someone very important said to me, pray for me, I'm looking for a job, and I forgot to pray about it. So right now, Noah, I'm gonna pray for you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray uh, for my nephew Noah. I praise you that he's here this morning. I pray to thank you for his willingness to ask for prayer. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that you will be with him as he looks for a job, that you will help him to find a job that will be a blessing to him, a job that will be filled with people of patience and hope and understanding, and that you will give him the strength and courage to work hard and be a good employee. Watch over him and keep him safe. In the name of Christ, amen. Thank you. So, we're in this series uh, that Dwight sort of ended our last series and rolled right into the next series uh, so eloquently, talking about spiritual gifts. Uh, how are we gifted? I think one of the great lies that the world tells us, uh, among many, is that we aren't gifted. I think the world or the adversary, whatever we want to call it, tells us over and over again that we don't need help, that we're not attractive enough, that we're not smart enough, uh, that we're not good enough, that we're not worthy, and that we don't have gifts. So often I find myself asking people at church um, about serving in a certain way, doing a certain thing, and they will often say to me, well, I'm not gifted in that way. I could never do that. And maybe they're just trying to get out of the job. But I think for the most part, each and every one of us lives within us a part of us that just thinks, I could never do that. I'm not gifted in that way. But these scriptures that we looked at this morning that we've heard read tell us otherwise. In verse 6, it says, Having gifts that differ according to the grace that has been given to us, let us use them. We've seen the Scripture, I think last week, Dwight focused on 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 
Also in Ephesians chapter 4, over and over again, we see in the Bible this clear idea that whether we want to believe it or not, whether the world tells us that we aren't gifted or not, we are indeed gifted. Each and every one of us has a gift. And we might quickly think to ourselves, well, you know, I'm not a gifted song leader like Rose, or I'm not a gifted worship leader like Renita Hurst, or I can't play the drums like Dave, or I can't preach like Hunter. That's okay. Part of what Dwight was talking about last week was the importance and the value of the different gifts. He talked about an orchestra. And he said, in an orchestra, you need all of the different sounds. You need the bass, you need the trebles, you need all of the different sounds to make something amazing and wonderful. And so, too, the body of Christ needs each and every one of us. No gift too big or no gift too small. No person too big or too young or too old or too small. God has gifted us. And there are a lot of gifts. From Ephesians chapter 4, he gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers. Again, from Romans, we have the gift of prophecy, of service. Lots of us would say that we have the gift of service. We're Mennonites, it's what we do. There are teachers, and my version says exhortation. Um, in many ways, it says encouragement. Encouragement is a gift? Absolutely. Encouragement is one of the gifts that God has given to us, that the Holy Spirit blesses with us in great need. Generosity. That's one that hits us, right? This church is incredibly generous. It's a church that gives and gives, sometimes till it hurts. We are people that are generous. We're also leaders. This church is loaded and filled with leaders, and we are called and we are invited to lead. The gift of mercy. We're going to talk about the gift of mercy in extra detail today. You probably figured that out already. From 1 Corinthians, knowledge, wisdom, faith, healing, miracles, prophecy, speaking in tongues, and the interpreting of those speaking in tongues. There are many, many gifts God has given to us for a purpose. What's that purpose? Now, I think Dwight covered that purpose pretty well last week, but I'm just going to hit it a couple more times. And I think Ephesians chapter 4, uh, verses 12 and 13, give us the clearest picture of the purpose of the gifts that we have been given. To equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now, I'm pretty certain we didn't try this, but when I read that, I hear an awful lot of Nestville's vision going on, inviting, engaging, equipping, the words straight out of Ephesians chapter 4, all people to be, all generations, to be like Jesus. We are to use our gifts to attain a unity of faith, maturation that looks like the fullness of Christ. Sort of a nice affirmation of that vision. In verse uh, 4 from Romans, he says, For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. So though many, um, the body... Uh, so we though many are one body in Christ, and individual, member, individual members of each other, called together to be the body of Christ. And from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. It's pretty clear, at least from Paul's understanding, that the spiritual gifts have been given to us for the purpose of building up the body of Christ. What does it mean, building up the body of Christ? I don't know that we exactly know what that means, but we can assume some things. It's about inviting people into this place, building up the numbers of the body of Christ. It's also about building up the spiritual maturity of the people within this place, of being community to each other. 
And we have to keep this as our backdrop as we think about each and every one of the gifts that we will study. The gifts have been given with a purpose to build up the body of Christ. So today we look at mercy. How did mercy become the first gift? I have no idea. Let's call it the Holy Spirit. I think as I wrestle with it that mercy is probably one of the most important spiritual gifts. Incredibly valuable. My wife and I were walking on the beach last week and I asked her, I said, Grace, what is the difference between mercy and grace? Not your name, but the gift from God. And we had a little bit of an argument and we, would, we walked around circles. Uh, so at some point in time I decided, you know, I need, to, I need to figure this out. So I Googled, I threw into my computer, I said, the difference between mercy and grace. And there were three or four different times that the same quote came up. So I don't know who it's from, but I liked it and I thought it fit really well. Mercy and grace are two sides to the same coin. Mercy is this. Now, if you take notes, this is is probably a sentence you want to write down. Mercy is when we don't receive that which we deserve. When we don't receive that which we deserve. Grace is when we receive a gift that we don't deserve. So on one hand, we're getting a gift that we don't deserve, grace. On the other hand, we are not receiving what we do deserve. And we think about ourselves, what do you mean? What are you talking about? What, you know, if I deserve something, it's something, well, obviously what we're talking about is the, deserve, the things that we deserve that are not good. It is when we do not receive what we deserve, when we do not receive punishment, when we do not receive certain justice. So think about it this way. If a child steals something, a cookie from a store, and the parent, you know, grabs the cookie and puts it back or sort of talks to the child about what happened, but doesn't punish them, doesn't make the child sit in the corner for three hours or pay for the cookie three times over, that's what mercy looks like. When we make mistakes, when we sin, when we break God's will and way, There is a sense that we deserve some sort of justice, some sort of correction, because that's what punishment's all about, right? We don't like the P word, the punish. We don't like punishment. Punishment sounds terrible, but punishment is about correction. It's about getting us back on the right path. Mercy is when, out of a position of power, we choose to let go of our right to receive compensation, our right to dominate. So, Think of a couple more stories to kind of help us to understand and grasp what where mercy looks like versus grace. I think many of you probably remember one of my favorite stories is the story of when I dented my grandfather's tractor. For those that weren't here, I'll try and keep it brief, but I was at my father's house and we were trying to push over a tree with my grandfather's tractor that had a big scoop in the front. And we, the tree wasn't going over. So my dad said, okay, come on out, come down off the tractor and let's look at this. So I didn't put the parking brake on and suddenly the tree moved and the bucket slid up the tree and the tractor rolled forward and smashed into the tree and it dented the tree. And so we have this great story of Hess family history. I was working the next day at Hess Brothers Fruit Company and my grandfather came to me. He walked up to me and just looked at me and all he said was one sentence that I've heard from my cousin Laura, I've heard from my wife, I've heard from my sister. It's kind of, you know, this is a great family sentence. A man, inferring that I was not a man, a man tells a man when he dents his tractor. (laughs) And he walked off. Now, at first glance, we might think that this wasn't really a big moment of mercy, but it was. In a contractual way, I owed him an undented tractor. In essence, I owed him the repayment that would, uh, that would take the dent out of the tractor, getting the tractor fixed, or at least some sort of punishment, like you can never drive my tractor again at least for a year. The correction, right? The mistake was made, some sort of correction should have happened. It never did. And I never heard about it again. Not the next time I stepped onto his tractor and drove away. He never asked me to come and work on the farm for free for the next six months to pay for the tractor. That's mercy. My grandfather was owed a certain recompense, compensation for what had happened 
he chose not to follow through. Mercy. Another story about mercy, uh, maybe kind of an anti-mercy story. You know, I don't know if you know this or if you've experienced this, but in the sporting world, there's this thing called the mercy rule. In many of our high school sports, if two teams come together and are playing against each other and one team's winning by a lot of points, the mercy rule will go into effect. And what happens is the referees or the judges that are kind of looking over and watching over things will just keep a clock running. Most sports have a clock. And they'll just let the clock run no matter what happens so that the game is over sooner, so that the team that's losing will be put out of their mercy. Um, Two years ago, my beloved 13-year-old daughter was playing in the National Indoor Hockey Tournament. And their coach said to the parents, I just need to warn you about this next game. This team that we're about to play is really good. So just sort of be prepared and and just take it. It's going to be ugly. Well, I didn't have any idea what she was talking about. So we got up, we went up to the staging area. We could watch the girls playing and we saw this team warming up. They're called the WC Eagles, the Westchester Eagles. And they look pretty good. And we thought, man, this this is probably going to be a tough game. You know, hopefully the girls play hard and show up. And, you know, after about two minutes, it's like six to nothing. Every pass they make was amazing. Every shot that they took was right on par. And they would do the same thing over and over and over again, every time it worked. And before the game was over, uh, you know, parents were standing around thinking, what do we have to do to get down to that coach to pull their arms off or something? Again, the score was 29 to nothing in what I think is like a 20-minute game. It was ugly. No mercy was shown. Again, in a contractual world, one person might say, if you don't want them to score 29 goals, stop them. They were all, I guess at the time, 11-year-old girls. 11-year-old girls on this side, 11-year-old girls on that side. Put them on the floor together and play the game, and the best team wins. That's the way of the world. It's the way the world works. No mercy shown. They didn't have to. They had the power. There was no reason for them to surrender it in this situation. Because you see, that's what mercy is all about. Mercy is about surrender, letting go of our power, letting go of our opportunity to dominate, letting go of our compensation, letting go of justice, for the sake of the other person. Now let's come back to the purpose. Let's come back to the meaning of these spiritual gifts. What is the purpose of mercy? To build up the body of Christ. What do we have to do to give mercy? In Romans 12, 1, it says, be a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. In Romans 12, Verse 3, Paul says, for, the by, for by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, do not think of yourselves more highly than the other. Think of yourself with sober judgment, each according to the measure that God has given. There's an invitation to sacrifice in mercy. There's an invitation to let go and to release And this is something that my grandfather did really well. How did his allowing me to get back on that tractor, how did his not demanding compensation build the body of Christ? Now, you'll see, for me, I think that it was actually a much stronger, um, I don't want to say punishment, it was a much stronger correction than punishing me would have been. Because the next time I got on that tractor, I checked the parking brake 15 times when I stopped it. Because I loved that man, and I respected him, and I appreciated that he didn't bring down upon me all of the punishment that he could have. I appreciated that he allowed me back on that tractor. And because of the grace that he showed, because of the mercy that he showed, we remained connected. No one would have faulted him for going in the more sort of legal manner. No one would have faulted him for seeking justice. No one would have faulted him for saying, hey, Hunter, 
I expect you to work this summer and create $500 and fix this thing. Nobody would have faulted him for that. No one would have said you're a terrible grandfather because it was owed to him. He deserved that. But in showing mercy, we stayed connected. In in showing mercy, I was still listening. In showing mercy, I believe I learned a much stronger lesson. And the body of Christ was being built. What if the coach of the WC Eagles had showed mercy? Now, here's the thing. The coach of that team was not concerned. The coach of that team's purpose is not building up the body of Christ. The coach of that team's purpose was not even building up girls' hockey. But what if it had been? What if their purpose going into that game was to raise up young women with a sense of compassion and joy for the game? What if the purpose for that parent, for that coach, was to raise up the game itself to help girls to have fun? Now, I would imagine they still go out and go up 6 nothing in the first two minutes. But after that, maybe you make some changes. Maybe you give some of your lesser players opportunities. Maybe you switch things up so that you're offering mercy to both teams. And maybe after the game, both of the coaches shake hands with a sense of respect and honor for each other. And maybe the girls afterwards hug each other and say, nice game. You could have really poured it on us, but thanks. Thanks for giving us a chance. Thanks for stepping back. That's what mercy looks like, and mercy builds up, and mercy grows. The body of Christ. Now, I know what some of you are thinking, because I've thought it myself. Okay, Jesus, Paul, mercy is so important. You're basically telling us to just let people go to give them an out. But what about accountability? And what about teaching, you know, right living? What about these certain things? And I think there is a time when mercy may not be the right answer, particularly probably a time when Hunter isn't as repentive. <laughs> when Grandpa walks up and says, a man tells a man, Uh, when he dents his tractor, and I look at him and say, well, the tractor was faulty. It was really not my fault. It was your fault. When there's not a sense of repentance, maybe there's times when we need to hold one another accountable. But Jesus doesn't talk about that. Paul doesn't talk about that. What he's talking about is mercy, and this is what God wants for us. Yes, I'm sure there's a time when accountability is needed, but far more often we need to lean into that which keeps us connected Far more often, we need to lean away from the legalistic law way of thinking about justice and think about Christ's justice for us. As Twyla read this morning, Jesus himself has much to say about mercy. In Matthew 9, 13, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Now, we recognize that we have to make sacrifices to give mercy, but this is not the sacrifice that he's talking about. The sacrifice that he's talking about is the sacrifice of some sort of creature to alleviate the brokenness of our sins. He is saying that he doesn't want us to live rightly, to live perfectly. He doesn't want us to worship perfectly if we're not being merciful first, if we're not showing mercy to others and, by the way, to ourselves. And in Matthew 5, verse 7, the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes, Jesus says, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. This is one of those places, we know it's those places in the times where Jesus says that we're supposed to forgive others if we're supposed to, to, if we want to experience forgiveness. Let me tell you what I think happens in the midst of this. It becomes a circular thing. The more we are merciful to others, the more we are willing to receive mercy. The more we receive mercy, the more we will be willing to give mercy. And it all begins with Jesus, who died on the cross to give us mercy. Knowing that we would make mistakes and knowing knowing already every mistake that Hunter will ever make, knowing every mistake that you will ever make, Jesus died on the cross as an act of mercy so that we wouldn't have to live filled with the guilt and the shame in our hearts that holds us back from God. 
Jesus first gives us mercy and invites us to be merciful. What would that look like for us, to be more merciful? To see a situation where we definitely deserve compensation, to see a situation where justice needs to be dealt and say, you know what? It's okay. Don't do it again. God invites us to be merciful because Jesus is first merciful to us. My challenge for you this week, challenge for me this week, is to take a moment at some point in time and think long and hard. Who in my life am I probably a little bit too hard on? Who in my life do I lean towards justice that would maybe help me, maybe help our relationship, that would be a part of us growing the body of Christ? How can I be merciful? Where should I show mercy? And don't forget you. One of the things that I find so often when I'm praying for people is this little call to say, God, give mercy to this person. Help them to experience the mercy of Christ. Because in our hearts, when we make mistakes, our human nature tells us, you deserve to be punished, you need to be corrected. It's punishment that corrects us. If we're not punished thoroughly and fully, we will never learn not to do these things again. I find that happening so often for myself when I'm, I, I'm in that moment of anxiety and frustration and my children are just pecking away and suddenly I just explode. And immediately the sense of guilt and shame that comes over me to give myself mercy, to give ourselves mercy is where it begins. We receive God's mercy we share mercy with ourselves and with others. I'll close reading again from Matthew 9, 13. Jesus says, Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I came not to call the righteous, but for sinners.